There are two common questions that I get that are pretty similar. The first is how long can a log sit before it's not usable anymore for lumber? And the other one is how long should I let my logs sit before I cut them up into lumber? So I'm gonna address that second one first. So there are a couple of cases where you might wanna leave a log sitting for a while before cutting it up into lumber. And the first is for a species that has a lot of inherent movement during the drying process. Now one example of that that I know of is sweet gum. That lumber, if you, let it, if you cut it right away and then you go dry it, it will twist and warp and do all kinds of weird stuff and will not stay flat. But if you let it sit for a while, it tends to have less of that in the drying process. Now there are some other species I'm sure out there that, ha that experience that same kind of phenomenon, but for the most part, most of the stuff we deal with, that is not the case. Now on the other side of things, there are some desirable traits to letting a log sit around for a while. So if you wanna have some spalting or you wanna have some color, um, some discoloration from the natural color, that's another good way to go as well. So if you want a more colorful palette in maple, for instance, leaving a log to sit for a while will do that for you. So in most cases, leaving a log to sit doesn't really offer any benefit, and if you let it sit long enough, it could offer a pretty good amount of detriment. Leaving a log sitting in log form, in that round form, to dry especially, is going to allow a lot of stress to build up in the log, which could translate later into boards that crack. Now as far as actually milling goes, if you've ever done any turning, you know how much easier it is to turn green wood than dry wood. Same is true for the sawing process as well. Fresh, green, wet wood saws a lot easier than dry wood has been sitting around for a while. And then of course, there's the old saying that lumber dries and logs rot. <laughs> so if you need to store logs for any period of time, there's a few tips for that. First off, seal up the end grains so it doesn't end up drying out and cracking and checking. That'll give you a little more yield on your logs. Next, get them off the ground so they're not sitting uh, in a damp, wet spot where that area will start to rot. And then lastly, especially if you're in an area where you have a lot of uh, insect potential, remove the bark as best as you can so that way the insects don't have anywhere to go. Now, where I am up here in Minnesota, we don't have a whole lot of issues with insects, so I like to leave the bark on. The bark just adds a layer of protection, helps to keep the log from drying out too quickly, and um, it's less work. <laughs> so now back to the other question, how far gone is too far gone? And honestly, the best answer for that is it depends. And because it depends, we're gonna do a few example logs here. So I have a couple pieces of maple. Um, these actually were from the same uh, tree. They kind of grew together and they were just offcuts from the lumber making process. These have been sitting around for either four or five years now. They're weathered, they've been in the sun and you know, they're just not in the best of shape. So I have these as sort of like a worst case. I highly doubt these are gonna yield anything usable. And I also have a stack of other logs that I cut uh, two years ago in my last Day in the Woods video that actually are in pretty decent condition. So you can see on this maple here, it has these really deep cracks and those have formed as the whole log has shrunk and built stress and essentially self-destructing. So even though I'll be able to cut down past where you won't see these cracks anymore, there's a very high likelihood that the boards are produced from this log will end up cracking during the drying process. So these two maple logs I have are gonna be naturally pretty goofy. They're from the bottom of the base of a tree where like the tree came out of the ground in two stems. So you can see this area here. And when I get the other one up here, the next one, you'll see how it would nest into here. So this was kind of like an off cut because it's really goofy. So I don't think I'll be able to mill anything super big or crazy out of this anyway. So this section up there was taken for lumber already. And this is just basically gonna be a piece of firewood. But uh, we'll see what's in here, I guess. So I'm gonna try and put this side down since that'll be a little more stable. Also have this big crack here. Uh, this is gonna be interesting. I think it's time to put a new blade on there. Anyway, so you can see the wood is really nice. It's maple, it's been sitting around for a while, so it's no longer white. It's got a yellow, blues, and red hue to it. But you can also see I still have all these cracks through here. So if I were to take a board off like this, you would have a board with a bunch of cracks in it. And in this case, it'd actually be splits. So they'd probably go all the way through, and you'd have a bunch of broken up pieces of a board. But, you know, if you're making pens, I guess you got a lot of pen blanks between the cracks. So I'll take another cut off of here and we'll take a look and see what we got. 
All right, so we still have the split here that's naturally in the log from when the tree was growing, but it looks like we're through all of the actual splits until this one out here. So, I mean, this is pretty cool stuff. I like the color a lot. Definitely cool. So I think, cause this thing is so, this thing is so goofy. I'm gonna try and roll this thing and hopefully I can square it up a little bit. We'll see how that does, I guess. Another clamp on here. Pretty cool stuff. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting color in there. And it looks like for the most part, we're through all of the drying cracks. Now it's, all that's left is this crack here. This is actually a bark inclusion from when the tree was growing, so it's just part of the log anyway. So I'm not gonna think of like, how do I wanna cut this thing? It's had a crack on both faces, both on the top here and down here. I can cut boards out of here and have some nice wide stuff. And it kind of looks like the crack ends right here. And then it's good. I can go from this side and get some narrower boards, have a crack running through them. I think I'm gonna go wide board. I'll probably be able to grab three decent boards out of here, three, three boards of four quarter out of here, and then maybe some weird chunk at the bottom. I've been seeing ants starting to scurry around on here, so I'm pretty sure I just cut through an ant nest, which is fine. Yep, this one's got, this log's got ants. Cool wood though. Looks like the next cut will be mostly all ant nest. All right, let's take a look. Boom. There they are. There's lots of larvae. A lot of little larvae. Just milling and what I'm doing right now by like shaking them up and getting them all out of here. It's very destructive to the colony. It tends to be enough to kill them but I will put these aside to watch. And if I still see ant activity later, you can just use a household ant killer spray uh, and that gets them just fine too. Yeah, so these aren't that deep in there. I can get to all of the little um, caverns right here, but otherwise I just take some compressed air and blow them out of the wood. And that pretty much takes care of them most of the time. So I'll set these aside. So they entered through this split here. So just by looking at this stuff, this looks pretty rotten especially through here so this does have a decent amount of rot to it as far as spalted maple goes but you know there are some decent areas that are still solid that have some really cool color so we'll see how those dry and we'll see if there are any more of those cracks develop but this is all full of ants this part here so i'm gonna set this aside probably some firewood. Might be able to cut some small chunks out of here that don't have ants in them. But 
for the most part. This is probably gonna be a waste. So this stuff has some really interesting and unique color to it. There's some nice spalting to the outsides here, but you can really see this was, you know, nice white maple at one point, and now it has all these different colors in it. And depending on if that is desirable for what you're doing, you know, whatever. <laughs> if you're looking for white maple, you gotta cut it before it's been sitting for too long. Now this log was pretty good. I mean, this is all, this is all pretty solid through here. It feels nice and solid still, but as they got further down the log towards the bottom, it got pretty punky and the center of these boards towards the bottom here are all they're all rotted out so on these last boards here the only really usable stuff is going to be the little strips towards the outside so on these next couple batches of normal shaped logs i'm kind of experimenting with the whole side by side or multiple logs at once thing so the logs i have on here right now are some of the larger logs that i have left to saw from left to right is cherry, red oak, birch, and there's also a smaller cherry log forward on the deck. So of course a lot of time and processing these logs goes into actually getting them oriented and turned as you're working through them. And the hardest part about that is they're laying all next to each other, so you have to kind of turn them against each other or scoot them out of the way and move them around. It can get pretty tedious. And then of course, because they're not all touching each other all the way down, the clamping pressure you can apply is kind of goofy and it's pretty hard to hold them in place. So one of the questions I get quite a bit is how thin can I cut? And I guess for me, I really don't have any interest in cutting thin stuff, but this trimming cut was you know, maybe about an eighth of an inch thick or so. So now the large cherry log is set on the lumber scale so I can start cutting boards from the bottom side when I get flipped back around and have four quarter boards evenly. So I'm gonna roll it one last time, make the last cut, and then I can roll it again and start cutting boards off of it. The other two still need another cut at least to get them squared up. So I was really wrestling with this whole concept of getting them all nice and square to the bed so that the cans come out square. But one of the things that I kind of realized as I was working through this process is that when you're sawing for furniture parts, like I am, the squareness of the cant doesn't really matter a whole lot. Because if you end up with a board that has an edge that's not square to the face, honestly it doesn't really matter that much because these boards are going to be getting used as is. They do get dressed later on after they're dried and before they go into use by running them over the joints or flatten them and square them up anyway. 
Now, of course, you don't want them to be too far out of square, but a little bit of deviation really shouldn't matter. And then here for the last cut, I'm stacking the previous boards underneath to raise the remainder up because my lift mechanism can't drop down far enough yet because I haven't fixed that. So to maintain the same board thickness, the previous boards get placed underneath it and then the saw head comes down by half the thickness of the kerf or about a sixteenth of an inch. The next batch of logs I'm working through are a lot smaller, so I'm actually cutting them all into cans individually and then setting them aside. This is a lot easier to manipulate each log individually to get that thing squared up. And then once I have a few of them all squared up and ready to go, I can bring in the other ones, set them next to the can that's currently on the mill, and then start slicing them into individual boards. This is a much easier process and goes a lot faster, and it's a lot less of a hassle to do it this way. The only downside to this is if you don't have any way to move the cans or the cans are too big to slide out of the way, it's kind of hard to do. So I'm thinking moving forward for all of the board making I do, this is a technique I'll use because I'll have the powered rollers in the mill once I have the hydraulics there. So I'll be able to make a can and then roll it out of the way with the rollers, square up another log, and then once I have enough to do maybe like three feet wide or so, I can bring them all back into position and then slice them all up into boards all at once. So here's the stack of lumber from all of the old logs I had. It's a few hundred board feet of four quarter and some thicker stuff at the bottom. So all this wood has been dried for a while. I dried it all indoors. So I pulled a few boards out from each species so we can take a look at the color variation as well as any potential structural issues within those boards because these logs are a little bit older when they were cut. So I'll just skip playing these and then we can take a look at all the boards. So first here is one of the boards from that cherry log that had a split in it and one of the things that split had done is some of the cracking kind of extends into the field around the crack and that area has a little more of a green tint from sort of that rotting process that was occurring inside this existing crack that was there from when the tree was growing or from when it was laying around or, or whatever it was there for a while that big crack through the log. But as you get away from the center area where the crack is coming out through here the wood is in, in just excellent condition. 
There is no issue structurally here. We do have some really cool blues coming in through here, which are pretty awesome. And a nice little bonus on this log is this actually has some curl to it. So if I can get the camera to see that, there is a little bit of undulation in the grain. So this does have a little bit of figure in it, which is a nice bonus. But even with a bore that's cracked like this, you know, you can still have a pretty good amount of usable material. You have some really nice straight grain here for like a door rail, for instance, you know, three inches wide of nice straight grain, clear stock that could be used for just about anything. Next board here is red oak, and this also fared really well for being so old. There isn't any super big structural issues. I do see some cracks throughout the sapwood area, but the sapwood anyway is kind of junky regardless, so this would probably be edged anyway, but that would remove any kind of cracking. What's really cool about the red oak is it has a lot more of a variety in the color palette, so there are some really nice deep pinks and reds as well as yellows, and then the normal kind of red oak kind of color, which is more in the brown family. But pretty cool piece of wood as well. And on this side, you can see some more of that red streaking, which is pretty cool. So next here is a piece of birch, and this fared really well as well. There weren't any cracks or structural defects at all, but you can see it does have a very different kind of color palette to it. There's a lot of color here. There's reds and pinks and blues, and oranges and yellows, and it's no longer that really stark white that birch normally is when it's sawn nice and fresh. So this definitely has some really cool color characteristics and is just absolutely beautiful. And lastly here is that worst case scenario, that maple. This has a lot of structural defects. So if we take a look at this one, you can see there are a lot of little cracks that start to extend through here and they're especially bad now that the wood has time to dry. When I had first cut this, you couldn't really see a lot of these cracks. Now they are literally everywhere. So although you could stabilize this with epoxy or something, but ignoring that fact, this would be all unusable essentially. But down here on this side, we do have the cracks that start to form on the outside of the log, and those extend about an inch into the board, so you would lose a little bit of material down here as well. But you do have about you know, four or five inches through here, which would be fairly usable. Now, what's really cool about this maple is the color palette. So if I pull in another piece here, you have some really beautiful spalting and some, some really beautiful color. This kind of purple color through here is just gorgeous. Just something to consider as you're milling this stuff up is you can get some really cool pieces out of it. You're not going to get anything super big or super usable out of something that was in that bad a condition, but you can find some pretty unique pieces of wood they can use as a complementary piece or for a smaller project like a box or some turnings out of that stuff. So it's definitely not all just has to be waste. It could certainly be used for something, but it's really going to depend on the kind of projects you want to do. So I hope you enjoyed this one and hopefully it answers some of the questions about the time frame for sawing. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments about anything I talked about today, or anything here in the shop or out in the mill, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking.